anyhow. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of papers. One is out already. And one hopefully will be out shortly uh, with Andrew and Frank. Um, what I'm going to be talking about, Andre gave the perfect introduction to this talk. So a lot of the filler stuff I had to say at the beginning to make sure I define things I probably don't have to say anymore. He even showed these uh, panels uh, from the Gow et al. paper in 2006, just showing what assembly bias is. It is, and we all know what it is by now after all these talks. It is, in this case, uh, halo assembly bias is manifested as the older, earlier forming halos being more strongly clustered than the general population or than the youngest halos in a certain simulation. Um, but I, I, I fixed maths. I fixed maths, yeah. Thank you. Um, but I would like to think about, uh, about it as just some other property in addition to mass controlling the clustering strength of halos. And if galaxies know something about that other property, then you have to potentially worry about it. That's, that's all. Okay. Um, so if I'm going too fast, I just think with the talks we've had this morning, um, I don't need to dwell on that, I guess. Um, so what I'm going to do is, in the first part of the talk, I am just going to show. Uh, so the way I started, actually, Andre gave a perfect introduction to this. I was worried about calculating the uh, cosmic shear galaxy cross-correlation in order to calibrate effects like um, baryonic effects disturbing halo profiles and things like that. And then I noticed I was getting some weird results, and I, I think it was due to assembly bias. So then I backed up and I did what I think is the simplest exercise you could do. Uh, so this is a couple of panels from the paper by Zahavi et al, looking at clustering in Sloan. Um, it's showing the projected two-point function here. I guess I could use the pointer. Projected two-point function here as a function of projected distance. And from these data, one infers these halo occupation distributions. And they're color coded, right? So the uh, minus 19 sample, this lowest one, is the darkest blue. And that's the darkest blue inferred HOD here. Okay. And there's a couple of parameters that are typically used. And min is some measure of the minimum halo mass into which you put a galaxy. And this, these functions are fairly cheap here. Um, there's a mass scale associated with having a satellite in the galaxy. And then the number of satellites grows with mass as some power of the halo mass. Alpha is the power law index, roughly somewhere close to one. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is trying to just mock this uh, inference up in simulated data where there is assembly bias. Seems simple enough. Seems like a test that you should do, right? Uh, so that's all I'm going to really say. Um, so the, the elements here are fairly simple. That's the same uh, panel from Zahavi et al. And I think Ravi and probably several other people already talked about splitting the correlation function in the one halo and two halo terms. Of course, this is in projection, so it's not so clean. We've mentioned that already. In the simple case, I'm being a little bit cavalier here, but just because I only have 15 minutes, the simple case is to think about the large scale clustering. More or less, the large scale clustering is some weighted average of the bias of the halo. The large scale bias is some weighted average of the bias of the halos. And it's weighted by the number of galaxies you have in your halo. And the small scale clustering, the one halo term, um, depends upon the pairs that you have in your halo. And this is that convolution of the distribution profile of pairs with itself. I'm just calling that lambda. So I don't have to write anything. <laughs> it's easy to have an analytic result when you just define a symbol for all the complicated stuff. That's what I like to do. Um, and this is usually split up into centrals and satellites. And so you have a central satellite pairs, and you have satellite-satellite pairs, and so on and so forth. And that's just to introduce where I want to go. Most of us are probably familiar with that, but certainly holler. Um, here, what I want to do is I don't want to argue about whether or not this describes the real world or anything like that. I don't care that much about it for this particular case. These are um, abundance matching and age matching catalogs that uh, Andrew constructed. And that's what I used to perform this exercise. So he went into Bolshoi. He performed abundance matching. Um, and these are the stellar mass ones. He performed abundance matching on stellar mass for the halos. And then he said, and then it's a little bit complicated, but more or less for the purposes of this talk, he split colors into by ages of the halos. So older halos have, re have redder galaxies. Younger halos have bluer galaxies. And that's his age matching. So you match the distribution of colors against the distribution of ages in the exact analogous way that you do abundance matching for stellar mass. See what I mean? Just adding a different dimension to it. If you don't see what I mean, you don't have to worry about it. That's not the purpose of this talk. 
But the point is that an abundance, an abundance matched catalog, even without the color selection, exhibits assembly bias, usually in the way people usually do it. Because the thing that you're um, using as your proxy for stellar mass or for halo size is V matched, or some measure of the circular velocity. That depends upon the mass of the halo and the profile of the halo, the concentration of the halo, if you want to think about it that way. So assembly bias is in these mock catalogs. And the only reason I'm showing this plot is to show, and it's obviously in the mock catalogs when you split by age to get the color, right? And the only reason I'm showing this plot is just to say, if you compare it to Sloan data, this is at least not a crazy way to describe Sloan data. These are the data and these are the predictions. Right? Um, the points of the data and the lines are the predictions. Um, so it has some of the richness that you might expect from a model that has assembly bias and is not that different from the data. That's the whole pur pur purpose of, of doing this. Um, so that's where I'm starting. And then what we did was we said, well, you can perform a really simple exercise. You can take those catalogs, and here I'm just showing clustering in these catalogs for a particular, lumi lum a particular luminosity threshold. Um, green is all galaxies, red are the red galaxies, blue are the blue galaxies. Um, you can perform this exercise. The solid lines with the points running through them correspond to uh, Andrew's default uh, uh, abundance matched and age matched catalogs. They have assembly bias in them. Okay? And the reason why I have two sets of points and two sets of lines is just because I generated mock data with those points. And then I fit it. The line or my HOD fit for those. I treat it as real data. I performed an HOD fit. That's the line. Those are the lines that go through those points. And then what I wanted to compare it to was a model in which there was no assembly bias. So the simple exercise is you just take all objects in some mass bin or some thin mass bin, and you experiment with the size of the mass bin and things like that, and you shuffle the galaxies among them. And then you preserve the HODs. The HODs are exactly the same. The HODs that go into making these clustering predictions are all the same. Okay, so the two, the, in each case, the dashed and the solid line has the same HOD. Okay. I generate these new data points, which are the lower data points. They have no assembly bias in them. And the dashed lines are the fits to those mock data. That's all. Okay. And so the question is, what do you get from this exercise? And I hope the exercise is clear. I have a catalog that has assembly bias in it. By mixing the galaxies, rearranging the galaxies among halos at fixed mass, I generate another catalog where the HOD is preserved, HOD is exactly the same, but the clustering is different. There's no assembly bias there. Okay, simply because I mixed only caring about mass, only holding mass fixed. Okay. So that's the whole point of this. Um, so you see several effects on large scales. In fact, on, our, on all scales, assembly bias caused what we're calling the red or the older halos to be more strongly clustered. That's not that surprising given what we know about assembly bias. Um, the young or late or late forming halos, they are more weakly biased due to assembly bias, more weakly clustered due to assembly bias, uh, at least on large scales. And then you have this funny effect on small scales, and that's because for this blue sample that we've constructed, uh, the fact that the, sen the satellites know about the central, and that's an important uh, quality here. So in other words, in these galaxies that are constructed in the way Andrew constructs them, if you have a blue central, you're also more likely to have a blue satellite. They're not just drawn from independent distributions. Okay? And so you get this upturn where in the assembly bias catalog, you have weaker clustering on large scales, and then it grows to be stronger on small scales because of this effect. And that's why I brought that up in the earlier slide. In order to predict the small scale clustering, you need to know what the average of the number of central times the number of satellites is. Okay. So now the question is, and again, I apologize if I'm rushing a little bit. And the question is, uh, what do you get from this, from performing this exercise? Here I'm just showing it at a, the same effects at a different luminosity threshold. You should see them all the same. Um, what do you get from performing this exercise? And this is the answer. This is one of the answers. I'll show you a few plots that look like this, and then I'll probably be out of time. Uh, so these are sort of traditional. I tried to design them to look traditional. I'm a very traditional guy. Um, HOD plots, right? So the little circles here, or the big circles, are the true HODs in each case, in each catalog, with assembly bias or without assembly bias. They're actually the same in each panel, right? Because this exercise preserves the HOD. 
So the circles, the red circles, are the same in every time. Um, this is just for one luminosity threshold sample. The green lines indicate that it's not split on color at all. I'll show you an example split on color pretty soon. Um, ignore this for a second. I'll get to that on the next slide. The point here is that if I look in the catalog where there is no assembly bias, a mock catalog constructed specifically to have no assembly bias, I infer, I would say, more or less the right HOD. The best fit is the black line going through here. And the green lines are just sampled from the posterior to be consistent with, within one sigma with the data. So that's kind of like roughly the types of HODs that you infer from doing this exercise. So it's kind of cool because you more or less get the right answer, which is good. I don't know if anybody had actually published that this actually works before. Jeremy could probably tell me. Um, you can tell me who then in that case. I wasn't able to find it. Um, so now, Well, yeah, I mean, so people have done that before, I agree. So the kind of, well, the signal kind of looks the same. Let's say it's okay. <laughs> people have done that before, I agree with that. Um, but this is what you get in the assembly bias catalog. I get a good fit in all cases. In some cases, I might get a better fit in, with the, uh, in some, for some luminosity thresholds, some color selections, I might get a better fit in the assembly bias case in the chi-square sense, or a better fit in the no assembly bias case. There's no real trend there. Um, so I get a perfectly acceptable fit. You wouldn't look at chi-square and say this is completely insane, but I just get the wrong HOD. Okay. And what you see is you get something that's much deeper. And this makes sense because if the clustering is driven to be stronger by assembly bias, you have to cram all your objects into as massive halos as you possibly can, right? Because you want to put them into more biased halos. So if you have a shallower transition here, you go shallower here, you have a long tail of objects in low mass, weakly clustered halos. That's more or less why this happens. Okay. And so that's a pretty typical case of what we found. Um, now I'll tell you what this FB parameter is, in case anyone cares. Uh, the point of really showing this is that I think I was pretty liberal in what I tried to do. FB is just a parameter where I let the overall bias on large scales be arbitrary. And I say I'm only now extracting the information that's in the shape of the correlation function. On large scales, the bias can be any number. And FB is just a number that multiplies the bias. <laughs> okay. So I, I fit that in addition to the HOD, and I roughly qualitatively get the same types of problems. And you can say I split on color. So that's the red sample. You can see it's pretty bad in that case. Um, and that's just because the assembly bias effect that I showed on the previous slide is most egregious in this case. Right? In other words, the enhancement of clustering in the mock catalog for that red half is much greater than it is for the sample that's not split on color. And so this effect is just more obvious. And again, it's the same HOD, the same true HOD that's underlying in each case. But in the model where there is no assembly bias, it makes sense, right? There's no assembly bias in the standard halo model. You infer the right HOD, more or less. And you infer something that's pretty wrong otherwise. Um, so we looked at a couple of other things. I'm about to run out of time, so I'll, I'll show these pretty quickly. I thought these were nice looking plots, but everybody tells me that they're hard to understand. Um, so I, I, you know, I wanted to boil this down into some of the basic HOD parameters. So what it is is the I go back to the MCMC chains, and I take the median value for the inferred parameter and the one sigma band. And that's showing this in pairs. For the red galaxies, I have the case with no assembly bias here. I have the case with assembly bias here. And the same thing for the blue galaxies, no assembly bias, with assembly bias, and then so on and so forth. Just so that you can see that the parameters you infer, not only are the curves that I showed in the previous plots, but the specific parameters you'd infer could be quite different. Yeah. Yes, they're all degenerate with each other. Um, it could be. I have to think about that. It, I mean, this tells you everything, I think, right? And then the question is, you know, I just wanted to show some parameters, so I did this, right? That, that, that's real. I mean, I think this tells you everything. You have the wrong HOD. 
if you think if you're happy by saying I have to write in new math, then that's fine. You can be happy with saying that. You have the wrong HOD. I don't think that that's in dispute. I think we don't know the answer to that yet. I mean, this is kind of the stuff that I started worrying about. That's why I did the exercise in the first place. Oh, yeah, I agree. I agree. I don't plan to stop. I don't plan to stop here. Um, there's only so much I can do at one time. So these are all more or less showing the same type of thing. And by the way, the reason why this is very narrow is because you know, once you get your HOD to be really steep, it can't go any steeper. <laughs> right? In other words, you're driven to be maximally steep. All of a sudden, at a particular mass, you go from having no, halo, no galaxies in a halo to having one. And then you're steep um, further. Because it's the opposite because you want it to be lower. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Oh no, I, I, I'm not saying which thing you should use or not use. The honest answer to that question, the honest answer to that question is I just had this coded up and I could do it right away. Okay? So that, that's all. That's all. Um, and, and this is uh, that power law index on the satellite portion of the HOD. That's what this panel is. So it's just showing again that they can be quite different. The things that you infer from this can be quite different this exercise. So that seems troublesome to me. Um, I still think it's troublesome. This is, let me, I'll put this in here, I'll block it out. This is, um, I wrote here quenched fraction, uh, but it's just fraction of red galaxies. Okay. In the mock sample, and it's the same type of thing. The points here are truly what you measure by going into each halo in the simulation and saying, how, what's my fraction of galaxies that are red? And that's as a function of halo mass on the x-axis. The uh, red line with the orange, uh, smaller, thinner lines uh, enveloping them, that's what you infer from the fit with assembly bias. The blue lines are what you infer from making the fit to the catalog without assembly bias. Okay? So it's kind of what I thought would happen, but it does happen. More or less, you kind of get the right answer, the green lines, the green and blue lines are more or less aligned with the data. Um, when you fit a model that doesn't have assembly bias intrinsic to it, and you get the wrong answer <laughs> when you do, right? In other words, you make, you would say, well, the transition in quenching has to be a very steep function of mass in one case, whereas a, a shallow function of mass in the other case. And in the mock catalog, it's a shallow function of mass. That's the point. So these inferred, these things that you can infer from these fits can be grossly incorrect just because of the fact that you infer the wrong HODs the wrong underlying HODs, which I think is an important point. Um, so that's more or less the point of what I wanted to talk about. I don't have that much time left, so I'll address very quickly what we, is that right? What, okay, very quickly, um, sort of what I'm working on now, what we want to get done, which is, well, if I, I think if you want to take this seriously, if you want to use these types of statistical methods to infer things about the galaxy population, what I want to do is to maybe marginalize out some effects if I want to do cosmology. Um, you have to worry about this assembly bias effect. All, all the fits that I get are acceptable fits, right? I can fit data that has assembly bias in with a model that doesn't have assembly bias. I just infer the wrong thing, right? That's the point. And so now what we want to do is uh, and this might be getting a little broke, but I think it's an interesting exercise to see how far you can get, is to just generalize in a really straightforward manner the halo occupation, or it could be conditional luminosity function. I have no preference one, of the, one over the other. Uh, formalism, where you just add other parameters, other properties of the halos that you're looking at. Formation time, concentration, whatever it is. Um, and what I would have showed if I had a little more time, so this is what Ravi was pointing out, right? You just make all that a vector, go on, integrate over all your parameters. Um, I just wanted to show some examples of the types of assembly bias you can get. Um, I'm not going to have too much time to explain the details of this plot, but this is basically doing that exercise. This is taking objects of fixed mass, and in this case it's concentration that we're sorting on. Okay. And we're saying that you have various assembly bias strengths. It turns out there's a maximal strength, which is not easy to write down, but a maximal assembly bias strength is just set by the limits that 
for example, for central galaxies, you either have one or zero. You, the assembly bias can't be so strong that you have a negative number of galaxies in your halo. It can't be so strong that you have more than one central galaxy in your halo, or at least I assume you can't have more than one central galaxy in your halo. Okay? And then this A bias parameter is just a parameter that says how strong is the effect in units of how strong it possibly could be. So A bias equals one means assembly bias is as strong as it possibly could be in that catalog, cutting on concentration. Um, and it's an max absolute, max absolute value here because you can, uh, you can arrange it so that the effect is positive or negative on large scales, whether you preferentially put galaxies into under-biased halos or more strongly biased halos. Okay. The effect is always positive on small scales because you're just accumulating objects into a smaller number of clusters, if you will. So that will always drive your clustering, regardless of the large-scale effect. It will always drive your small-scale clustering to be stronger. So you get this variety of potential scale dependencies. That's the main thing I wanted to point out here. And uh, I guess I have to stop now. So I won't show my next couple of slides. But uh, that's kind of where we want to go with this. Uh, and I think the takeaway message is uh, if you want to take this exercise seriously, I think you do have to worry about these effects. It's definitely not true that you can fit something with a model that has no assembly bias in it and then say, therefore, there is no assembly bias. Right? Um, it's even not true, and in supernovae they have the analogous problem. It's even not true that you could say, I can't measure an assembly bias parameter, therefore it can't be biasing my cosmological parameters. So in supernovae studies, they know that they may or may not have two populations of supernovae. They don't have the power yet to distinguish unambiguously if there are two. But they know that that can lead to a very large systematic error on W. Whether, uh, they don't have to have the power to distinguish them. They can still bias W. And the analogous thing is happening here, happening here. So I think you have to take modeling this pretty seriously if you want to push forward. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, so I'll stop here. I won't say anything else. <laughs>